Our fourth speaker for this session is uh, Marc, uh, Marc Chandelard, sorry. Uh, it's okay, it's French. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just weird. Uh, anyway, uh, from uh, Grinnell College, and uh, he's been described as a, an experimental mathematics activist to me. <laughs> so uh, that should be a very topical talk, so uh, right. please take it. Uh -huh. I'm not called an activist too often, that's all right. <laughs> Okay, so um, I've been doing experimental math and research for a number of years, and uh, I developed a, an undergraduate course that I want to talk about. Um, some of my research ideas have been folded into that, but there are very few courses that are taught even internationally that try to um, advocate for the paradigm, the, the type of thinking for experimental math, and so this is what I want to talk about. You can't take mine, that's why right next to your computer. It'll automatically work. Uh, the USB pieces here. That'd be awesome. Yes. You probably <laughs> just pick on to me when it should work. Normally. Whoa. Uh, just click on your slide and then try the clicker. I, I've seen this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should work. And then, uh, keyboard, shmeyboard. There you go. Right. Uh, so, um, so what is experimental math? And I'm, I notice I'm not the first one who has stolen this picture from the cover of one of John's books. <laughs> it's due to Carl Heinz Hoffman. Right. He deserves all the credit. Okay. So, um, what is experimental math? We're using um, usually computer, not exclusively, but usually some advanced technology to do things like find patterns and relationships in mathematical structures, testing and falsifying conjectures, suggesting approaches for formal proof. Most people think of computers as mainly just replacing um, hand calculations, but I want to emphasize it's a new way of thinking, the idea of experimental mathematics. It's not just an extra sidekick to doing traditional research. And I'll, and I'll give some examples for that. So um, why does this make a great advanced undergraduate course? So first of all, this course is very integrative. I'm pulling very, many different topics from the undergraduate curriculum, whether it's um, different function representations and special functions. There will be stuff from um, uh, the more algebraic side, like with number theory, et cetera, but also um, analysis, um, the idea of visualization comes in. Lots of different parts that our students should be learning all fits neatly under this umbrella. Two, it models how a lot of research is done. And we don't say this often in our papers. We come up with our results, we use these tools, but often um, the tools are, are they're very helpful. We couldn't have come up with some of these conjectures we make or falsifying things without um, uh, having used this kind of approach. And it's positioned at the right time. So advanced undergraduates are, um, they're, they're ready. They're ready for, if they've been taught properly, they're ready for good research experiences. And uh, this all folds together quite neatly. And I'd like to mention also that uh, the development is, of this course was supported by the National Science Foundation. Okay, so what are my goals for this course? One is to develop a fluency in a computer algebra system. And I will unashamedly say since I did my degrees at Waterloo, my, my, uh, uh, my native computational tongue is maple. So I use maple throughout this course. Um, and it means just learning some basics um, sometimes people think using the computer, experimental mathematics, you can only use some high-powered techniques or algorithms. But I would argue even some relatively simple things are often overlooked and can be very helpful using tools like Maple. Um, I emphasize the experimental math approach. So contrasting the traditional or old ways of doing problems um, versus this, this new approach with experimental math. So it, again, I want to emphasize, it's not just the computer and the tools we use, they're not just add-ons, but there's a, a different way of thinking that comes into solving some math problems. 
And I want to emphasize, I emphasize in the course some more recent tools like Zylberger's algorithm, PSLQ algorithm, and, and the OEIS. All right, um, the last few weeks of the course, I emphasize a, a research experience so the students will choose a big project to work on. Um, I guide them with topic selection, and they are doing original research. What does the U stand for? Which U? REU. Oh, Research right. Experiences for Undergraduates. Oh, for right. Yeah. It's a special program in the NSF. So here's, here's an example. So maybe this is uh, a geometric property you have seen before. So the question is, you have three complex numbers. Call them A, B, C. Imagine these points in the complex plane. And the claim is those three points will form the corners of an equilateral triangle if and only if, I don't know, point wrong. Uh, well, if and only if this equation holds. So you might imagine some traditional approach to prove this kind of equation. And I can see you making a figure, maybe trying to identify a center of a triangle and do something like that. Let me show you an approach, a different approach to come up with doing this. So um, don't worry about the red maple code so much, but the idea is I'm going to define three new variables, and uh, A minus B times its conjugate, of course, is the square of the distance between points A and B. I do the same with A and C, and I do the same with B and C. Now, if I had an equilateral triangle, you know that all those, those three distances are the same. So let's do the following. Let's build an expression where I have these squares of the distances of the side. I'm going to take the difference and square it, the difference of these two and square it, and then the difference of the last two and square it, and add them all up. And if we had an equilateral triangle, we know that that whole expression would be 0. So let's take that whole expression. Let's expand the whole thing. Then let's factor it. And this is what maple produced, two clean factors. And you can see that the first expression is just the conjugate of the second one. And you can translate this mathematically into this equation. So maple, with just a little bit of expanding and factoring, and inspired guessing at what to try, has produced this identity. And with this one equation, you could instantly prove the result you want. If you had an equilateral triangle, the left side would be 0. So it forces the right side to be 0, which is um, our claim. And if this side was 0 because it's a sum of squares, you end up forcing an equilateral triangle. So very different than what you would expect um, from a typical pencil and paper approach. But the computer is using algebraic properties to do essentially a proof for us. Um, here is another example, and I won't, I won't uh, go through all the details clearly. Some of you may remember the classical result called Ptolemy's theorem, which says if you have four points in the plane, they are, um, they are uh, cyclic. Uh, they are points on a circle if and only if you have this kind of uh, property holding. So um, another characterization is that the points are concyclic if the cross ratio of that expression at the bottom is real. Well, doing something similar, I've built this equation up here. And um, this one equation proves the equivalence of these two characterizations for four, four points being concyclic. And again, Maple is doing like a lot of the work for me. It's just uh, the geometric property is being encoded in this algebraic expression. All right, let's move on. I've done um, some, so when I do the class, um, this is in a computer equipped classroom. Each student has their workstation. I prepare, um, at least for at least the first half of the course, I will prepare a Maple worksheet. I distribute it to the class ahead of time. And then as I'm going through elements on the worksheet, I invite the students sometimes to take this expression, change this variable here or <laughs> something like that, just explore a little bit. And then, and then maybe once each hour, I will say, I want you to work in pairs. And I will give them a problem. And then I ask them, pick a partner close to you, and I'm going to give you 10 minutes to see what you can come up with. So here's a couple of examples I want to show. Here was compare these two integrals, where m and n are positive integers. And when they play around a little bit, um, um, 
First, if you try to do these exactly in Maple, you get beta functions come up, and then most students haven't seen this yet, so what's a beta function? And I say, well, you go online and find out what that is, and they have to teach themselves a little bit what that is. Um, and, there, and I ask them, what is the relationship between these two integrals? And I say, what happens if you compute them numerically? And then they see that they actually are the same value, no matter what m and n are. And, and that invites understanding properties of the beta function. So they get to explore a little bit and see this kind of thing. Here's another example that I cooked up um, from research I did a few years ago. So I define this a set of polynomials, a sub n will be a degree n polynomial, and I ask them if they can simplify this infinite series, which looks like a strange animal because you've got these polynomials, you're multiplying two of these polynomials, taking a reciprocal, and then taking an infinite series. And why would you expect anything nice to come out of this? And um, uh, before I present this problem to them, we're looking at manipulating infinite series with Maple, doing stuff with that. And, um, uh, and then a few of them get inspired. They, you calculate, let's say, the first 10 terms of this, and I say, and they expand it out, and I have them try to expand it around various values, and it ends up if you expand around infinity, which is not usually your first choice, you get this series come out for the first few terms. And of course, we see things look cleanly. You have these Catalan numbers on top and an alternating series. Um, I've told them already about the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. So I say, put that in. And they see it's the Catalan numbers. And I'll say, OK, can you find the closed form formula? It's on that page. Plug it in. Now have Maple compute this series where you've plugged in the, in the explicit expression, and they get a closed form expression for this. So again, Maple is helping us to get the insight that you're not going to probably see doing it by hand, even for a while, unless you buried it, you burrowed into this area quite a bit already. All right, so solving problems in new ways. Here's, a, here's another problem. Uh, think about this for, for 15 seconds. Sine of 19x, how can I write this as a polynomial in the variable sine of x? Well, if, I, if, if you gave me this problem, I would probably think of the multiple angle formula. Mm -hmm. I'd start breaking it up, maybe even doing it, you know, doing it iteratively. I might have the idea, oh, can I program this recursively or something to break it down? And maybe that's possible. That sounds like it might be a lot of overhead to me to try to, to write some recursive algorithm to do something like this. Um, don't worry about all the maple code, but I just put it on to show that um, here's a couple different ways of solving this problem without the overhead of building like recursive procedures. So one is I take sine of 19x, I build this general function with odd powers of sine with the variable coefficients, you expand it out, and then I expect, um, I expect if, I have, if I have an equation, I expect this to be the zero function, so I expand it out, and I basically solve this linear system, I set a whole bunch of coefficients, a whole bunch of, of these coefficients <coughs> equal to zero, I solve for the a's, and out will come the answer. You can do something similar by just taking multiple derivatives at the origin. Now, this is obviously not anything you would do by hand, but again, we've got the computer to help us out, so it's thinking in a different way than you would if you were doing things by hand. The PSLQ algorithm is a relatively <coughs> modern algorithm and integer relations method that David Bailey and Helaman Ferguson uh, developed uh, a number of years ago. And the basic idea is if you're given um, n, n values, can you find a non-trivial uh, linear relationship between them to solve uh, that, that weighting equals zero? And so the PSLQ algorithm, which is implemented in Maple and not in Mathematica, uh, Mathematica. helps us. Oh, the it's in Mathematica. Under it is? Yeah, no vectors or fine null relations. Well, then it's fewer than, than what I looked last time. And maybe better hit. So um, 
So if I apply the PSLQ algorithm to the problem on the last slide, um, the code is simple. I just pick some long random number by typing, typing some value of x out here. And I tell PSLQ, I'm going to give you sine of 19x and a bunch of these uh, powers of sine. And it will give me the weights right away. So there's uh, an even shorter code to be, to be able to generate what I want. Um, here's a less trivial. Yeah. Do you avoid uh, the Moiter's formula for a reason? Um, yeah. All right. You could use de Moivre's formula, but but is de Moivre's formula going to produce this easily? What I have in yellow. You, you, have, to you have to expand. Yeah. yeah. You, have you have to expand. To expand. Yeah. 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 You have to expand. The six eight ten formula. Some of you may have seen this. Here is a, uh, an expression f sub m, which is a sum of six m powers. And you have variables x and y. Um, you can take small values for that m. And curiously, uh, with the signs in front of those terms, you get f sub 1, f sub 2, and f sub 4 all equal to 0. Um, and Ramanujan found this curious identity, which some people have described as they think of one of his most beautiful formulas he produced. And this holds for all, all of these formulas hold for all values of x and y. And it's still a mystery how Ramanujan came up with this relationship. Um, and then about 15 years ago, Michael Hirshhorn came up with a similar identity with these even in, in, in the C's at the bottom. And when I saw Hirshhorn's, when I became aware of Hirschhorn's result, I said, oh, there's got to be some kind of experimental math can help us find some pattern here. And my first, my first reaction was to use uh, PSLQ to help find stuff. Now, you notice that on each side, the terms are homogeneous. 3 plus 7 is 10. 5 times 5 is 10. You have homogeneity here. And so using Maple's partition function generating um, a sequence of terms that have all the same homogeneity, and then using the PSLQ by plugging in X special values for X and Y, I found some other identities. But, you know, that just got the ball rolling, and then Maple was able to eventually help me find this general relationship. And with this relationship, you can produce Ramanujan's result, and a whole plethora of other formulas pop out nicely. But again, um, it was using tools like PSLQ, OEIS that helped me, um, and fact, just basic factoring uh, built into Maple helped me to find a um, formula like this. So my students get to explore um, uh, this kind of phenomena. Sauerberger's algorithm. So this is really kind of magical stuff to me because Sauerberger came up with these techniques which we're able to um, study, study difference equations. Um, I don't think you're going to find a more curious title of a book than A equals B, which is <laughs> what he wrote. Um, um, and so here's an example of what Zeilberger stuff um, would do if I define the sum f of n as the sum over all appropriate k's. Um, Zeilberger's algorithm will produce this relationship. And then from there, it's a simple step to get a closed form formula. So um, um, we go through various things that these algorithms are built into Maple. And we have, uh, uh, they have some fun um, looking at these different, uh, these different kinds of combinatorial sums. So what's this picture? Okay, maybe you have to be a bit farther back. So does anybody recognize this? Mm -hmm. All right, you think it's the Mona Lisa, but a mathematician looks at it and just sees a closed curve. <laughs> now, um, so the, the, the real question you ask is, how do you take this picture of the Mona Lisa and get a closed curve come out of it like this? So uh, this was created by Bob Bosch, who's at Oberlin College. And um, he, is a, he does operations research. And he thought about taking, uh, taking a sample of the density of the picture and putting points and then applying a traveling salesman algorithm to be able to generate this closed path. So not the first thing you would think of, but I put this up to say we have these 
powerful techniques like algorithms used for solving traveling salesman problem, and the idea of repurposing algorithms for problems you wouldn't think about. And this is one of the ideas I'm trying to encourage people to think of, this repurposing of existing work for you know, non-standard stuff. Um, here's an example where I took this matrix filled with Fibonacci numbers, and I used the so-called LU decomposition, which is a very well-known tool in numerical linear algebra, but I applied it to this exact matrix. I'm not trying to do numerical stuff here, but do an exact factorization. And you can see Fibonacci numbers come up in here. You can identify the IJ element in all three of these matrices. And this spawns, um, spawns a formula. And this is a well-known formula um, for Fibonacci numbers. But the point is this comes out naturally by using um, a tool from numerical work and applying it to specially structured matrices. Here is another more complicated example with central binomial coefficients. I have this nice LU decomposition. I use tools like OEIS and whatever to help me identify these terms. Um, and I built a little more sophisticated looking combinatorial formula here. And I have lots of other examples with this, not only with numbers, but with special functions like Legendre polynomials and various other things. Okay, other topics that I cover in the course, which I'm not going to give lots of examples about, um, randomness and Monte Carlo methods. Sometimes solving stuff exactly is difficult, and so the idea of using random number generators that are built in um, and doing simulations can be very helpful in seeing what's going on. Of course, they need to learn some basic programming if they haven't seen that so far. Um, we talk about computational efficiency because in, for some of these algorithms, PSLQ comes to mind. If you want to be able to use it, you need to sometimes generate very high precision values of real numbers that come up in the quantities you're considering. And so how can I compute these in a fast and efficient way? And so we, we talk about efficiency. I mentioned the example of Strauss and multiplication. So uh, multiplying two matrices, n by n matrices. The standard multiplication is big O of n cubed, but Strauss and multiplication reduces that exponent 3 down a little bit. Um, visualization, you see this picture in the back of a Julius set associated with uh, Newton's method. So we talk about uh, visualization abilities and how to program and plot stuff in Maple. Um, I will have one time where the class, I will give them papers to read and we talk about the philosophy of experimental math. Questions about, uh, you know, is the proof of the four color theorem legitimate, quote unquote. And we explore these kinds of questions. And also cautions about experimental math. You know, it, it's a powerful hammer, but not everything's a nail. So <laughs> you have to be careful how to, uh, you, you, you don't make false, uh, false steps um, computers can, um, can lead you astray occasionally. Um, and we talk, of, I have projects that I have them do in this course. Um, one thing, uh, so Maple, when you first load it, it has this kind of the standard kernel which is loaded, but it has all these sub packages. So I want them to uh, become familiar how to be able to teach themselves. So I have each student pick a different sub package in Maple and I have them prepare a worksheet and present it to the class. And this is very helpful. Um, it helps all of us become more aware of the capabilities. I have them review an experimental math paper, um, which I have to approve, and they present uh, the findings of that to the class. And then there's their final project where I will help them choose a new original topic. They have to explore it, present this to the class, and write a report. And here are some examples of things um, that my students have done. Extend the PSLQ algorithm to not just integer coefficients, but let's say you know, some, some modest size algebraic coefficients. Um, infinite series that were considered by Ramanujan and extending those. The so-called lonely runner conjecture, which is a well-known open problem in number <coughs> theory. And um, even some more interesting statistical kinds of things like looking at the convex whole of random sets of points. So, uh, 
So what does experimental math let you see besides this person? So thanks for your attention.